Welcome back to the bluegrass on this beautiful April day. The weather is exceptional. Uncle Stoney's in a great mood. Okay, puppy, because all the dogs are doing well. Uh, these puppies are now 13 weeks old. And so we thought we would check in and talk to you about what we call the socialization sweet spot. And you might say, well, Stoney, what do you mean by socialization sweet spot? Each one of these videos that you make about puppy developmental stages, you talk about how important it is. Why would you consider one of them the sweet spot? Well, I consider 12 to 16 weeks kind of a sweet spot because it's a good chance for owners to make up for whatever wasn't done properly during the formative socialization phases, okay? So I'm gonna kind of give you an idea of where my puppies are at uh, 13 weeks. And uh, then what you guys can do is you can look at your own puppies. <laughs> And if you aren't here, then what you need to do is get busy and catch up, guys, because socialization is like a window, all right? So uh, when puppies are young, the window's wide open, and as they get older, then that uh, window starts to close. And it never closes all the way, but it starts to get hard to squeeze things in. So at 13 weeks, I like to have puppies that'll come when you call them, be relatively still when you tell them, have good manners. Uh, from my neighbor's perspective, we are still working on that. Come on, buddy, with this little fella here. He's kind of ornery, but uh, he comes by being ornery naturally. You know, his granddaddy, very ornery. His dad's pretty ornery, and his mom's kind of ornery, and she can't remember. So, so we've got calm, and we've got be still, and we've got good manners most of the time uh, but he can still be rough on some other dogs and uh, he can be a little bit aggro you know a little bit rough on children and sometimes he'll do stuff like this like we walk this course a bunch and he gets to this point and uh, I used to give him a lot of treats here and uh, you know I'm like hey now you're a big boy you're 13 weeks old you can you know do with a few less treats and look at him he's like no Stoney you got to come back and give me a treat so he kind of holds me hostage just every once in a while come on buddy but uh, all in all I mean he's pretty good and how we deal with, uh, you know, this fact that he's ornery with the other dogs at this stage is uh, we do a little bit of black lab therapy. So here in a second, we're going to talk about socializing the dogs to boats and four wheelers. And uh, you're going to notice that I bring out some black labs to serve as mentors because uh, black labs, you know, like I say in all my videos, uh, you know, all dogs want to be uh, labs and all labs want to be black. But if you have this kind of dog right here, let me give you a nice sideways view of him so you can kind of see what he's built like. Get you a piece of food here and stretch him out a little bit. But um, so if you have a kind of dog like this right here and you got some nice black lab mentor dogs around, it really helps mellow them out. You know, these guys, they learn quickly. They're very pattern cognizant, very athletic, high energy level, high endurance, quick recharge rate, all that cool stuff, you know. But the honoriness, come on. If you own these kind of dogs and you know they're kind of honorary, and if you plan on continuing to own these kind of dogs, you ought to invest in a nice black lab <laughs> to kind of mellow them out. All right, now we'll get a sister out and we'll show you the other thing that we do in terms of obedience. We like to, with our young dogs, introduce uh, what's called a targeting stick. And that's how we overlay our off-leash uh, obedience patterns for the post-adolescent phase. All righty, now George is going to do a little target stick work. Okay, Georgie, go ahead. Now you might say, now Sony, what's the point of the target stick? Why are you doing one with the leash and one with the star target stick? Well, uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, like if you ever take the time to use a target stick with a young puppy, you'll realize it's very valuable for uh, teaching uh, specific and complex behavior change later on. But what we really like is that it forces a trainer to design their sessions well, and especially as it relates to the timing of the sessions. Puppies are just like people, you know, they have biorhythms that, uh, you know, make them good at stuff or not so good at stuff at uh, certain times of the day. And uh, so when you're gonna use a targeting stick, you can't fall into the trap of forcing the dog to mind like you can with the leash. You have to do everything in such a way that the exercises induce the dog to give you the behavior that you want. So training with the targeting stick is as much an exercise for the handler as it is for the dog. But uh, we really like it. And uh, like I said in the last video, it's just kind of fun and cute because <laughs> like ultimately what you want with the dog later on is just to be able to point places and uh, tell them to do stuff, right? Well, that's what's going on here. That puppy is learning to take direction from George and George is learning to give direction uh, in such a way as the expectations are conveyed in a clear and concise manner. And that's very awesome. Wait right there, Georgie, for a second. Very nice, easy on the way down. There you go. See, this right here is completely cooperative exercise. George has no way to bring compulsion into this exercise. So George uh, is forced to make sure that his vocalization, his posture, 
uh, and his reward timing are done in a proper manner. Okay, Georgie, use your stick. See if you can get her to stack out a little bit there. And so we can come up and look at her from this side. Come on, come on, come on. Okay, so I had to come over here and help Georgie a little bit. And the point I was trying to make uh, is earlier when I kind of showed you guys the side view of the other puppy, I was able just to kind of hold his leash and I think I might have moved him around with my uh, hand a little bit. When you're using the target stick, like you don't have that option. You can't just be a lazy dog trainer and take and hold your leash and, and, and move the dog where you want them. You have to learn to be a master right, of controlling your posture in relation to the dog. And these kind of dogs are very sensitive to posture. You'll notice if the cameraman gets uh, too close, like come up here a little closer, cameraman. Like that dog will look over there and be like, hey, why is the cameraman coming up so close? Now with the targeting stick, I've got to convince them to stay close to me, you know. And uh, speaking of convincing them to stay close to me, we're fixing to socialize them uh, a little bit to the boat and to the four-wheeler. And again, we got a couple of options. Like I can put a leash on them and I can just uh, like kind of to, to make them get up in the boat or make them get on the four-wheeler and that works. But what we like to do, generally speaking, is see if we can't convince the dog that doing things are a good idea. Now to help with this, we're gonna let out some black labs because black labs uh, make, make great mentor dogs. And we're gonna go over here and try to get on the boat Try to get on the four-wheeler and hopefully what will happen is, uh, you know, these young puppies will see the older dogs getting in the boat and get on the four-wheeler and they'll tag right along and you will see in real time the value of having mentor dogs. Now earlier in the video I tried to uh, demonstrate the difference between using a leash and uh, using a targeting stick and I tried to make the point that hey, if you want to take the slow and scenic route and really focus on becoming a better dog trainer, a better handler, then the target stick is the way to go when you're teaching obedience to a young dog. It's really awesome for making puppies understand like where you're pointing and what you want them to do and my intentions uh, were to when I show you the boat and the ATV uh, socialization process, I was going to use the targeting stick and kind of make myself look fancy. You know, I was going to take my little stick and I was going to point to the boat and have them get up on the step and then let them work on that a little while and climb in the boat, you know. Uh, and do the same thing with the ATV and kind of throw in some mentor dog stuff. And I had it all planned out in my mind. It was going to look awesome. But then uh, in between takes, my cameraman, who's about to step on a dog back there, my cameraman reminded me that I don't have that timeline preference available because we already have on the books for next week a bunch of ATV and and uh, 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 water stuff, you know. And so we got to get in the canoe next week. We got to get the kayaks out, and we got to get the John boat out. And we're taking some dogs down to Hollerwood. So my week is it just got away from me. I didn't realize what week it is. So what I'm going to have to do is adjust my timeline preferences, and this is going to happen to you guys a lot. You got to understand that in dog training, you can't let perfect be the enemy of good enough. Okay, so in a perfect world, I was going to show off and get my targeting stick out and have these puppies hop up on the four wheeler and in the boat. Okay, not a perfect world, so I'm going to have to go the old fashioned route and I'm going to have to double up on my socialization efforts and not only get them in the boat and on the four wheeler today, but I'm going to have to get them in the boat and start acclimating them to the rocking motion and, and crazy sounds and the same thing on the four wheeler because I only got two or three days to knock this out. So we're going to go with a leash. So instead of using a targeting stick, which again would be perfect and look really cool, we're just going to put a leash on them and we're going to take the, the option of not getting in the boat away and we're going to take the option of not getting on the four-wheeler away and we're going to kind of say this to them. Look, watch the labs get in the boat, do what the labs do. Watch the labs get on the four-wheeler and do what the labs do. So it's pretty concept, pretty simple concept. Watch the labs do what the labs do. All right, so we're going to head up here to the course and get in the boat, and then we're going to get on the four-wheeler, and I'll show you how to make the best of a situation where uh, you just uh, you didn't keep up with your homework. Right, well, I had George uh, run ahead and put a leash on my dog. And remember, guys, what a leash is, it's just a long handle, you know. So <laughs> if, you, if you need your dog to be in a situation where they're controllable, you just put a handle on them, you know. Now, we're going to go over here to the boat. And uh, I'm going to have some labs jump in the boat. I'm going to make sure this guy can see him so he has a basic idea uh, that I want him to get in the boat. And now he's tired now. Now the reason I made him tired is because I wanted him not to be very reactive once he was in the boat. And you got to remember that there's an inverse relationship between exercise and anxiety. Anytime you're having to really try to knock out some socialization or some desensitization, a pre-fatiguing session should be first on your list. Come on, Oaks. Come on, come on, come on. So I pre-fatigued this puppy. And I'm going to call my dogs. Come on, hop up. 
Very nice. Now, so you see this puppy sees what's going on. Come on, Charlie. And Charlie sees what's going on. He's kind of small, so he needs a little help, you know. And uh, at some point, my dogs will get out of the water trough, and I think they'll come over here. Come on, nerds. Come on, dogs. And so I want to make sure that he sees plenty of dogs getting up in here, and he sees that it's okay. Come on, up, 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 up. Very nice. Come on, come on. Get in there, poorly. Up, up, up. Now, this dog, you notice he's like looking over there because he sees something that he would rather chase and do. Perfect world. I would come out here, low distraction environment, get him to where he puts his feet up here, reward him, then gradually get him into the boat, and then add a little bit of distraction each session. Okay, not a perfect world because I messed up on my calendar. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my handle, and I'm going to show him. I'm going to say, dude, <laughs> look, you see those other dogs up there? You can get up there. And I'm going to take a little treat. And I'm just going to kind of give him the idea that I would like for him to come on up this step and make some effort towards getting in the boat. Good. Now these nerds are in my way, so I'm going to throw some treats back there. All right. So he understands that, hey, Stoney would like me to do something, but now he's kind of tired. If I wouldn't have fatigued him, I probably could have got him to get into the boat. The problem with that would have been that if I got him to get in the boat, and because he had a lot of energy, he very well might have jumped out of the boat once I started rocking it and making a lot of noise okay so I had to make a decision there and I decided to err on the side of helping him be calm attentive and polite so we're going old school just gonna help him a little bit good and then every time that we do this exercise I will help him a little less now I'm gonna hop up in the boat and I'm just gonna rock the boat around make a lot of noise set up here and pretend to be the captain And since he's tired, he's just like, yeah, whatever, okay? <laughs> Listen, that's the best pro tip I can give you when it comes to doing uh, desensitization or socialization is take advantage of the fact that pre-fatiguing sessions take out the heavy lifting of a desensitization uh, exercise. Oh, no! Broke my boat. <laughs> Welcome to the dog business, guys. This is every day. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to get out of here and we're going to head over to the four-wheeler and we are going to do the same thing uh, in terms of uh, methodology. We're just going to uh, socialize the dog to a different piece of equipment. Come on, puppies! So I come over to the four-wheeler and I'm going to be like, hey, come on, hop, up, up. And the labs are going to jump up there. Come on, come on, buddy. And this dog's going to see them jump up there. And so he kind of looks at me and he goes, Stoney, I see those dogs look, jumping up there, but, you know, how about I just stand here and be calm, attentive, and polite? Normally, that would be pretty good, okay? But in this situation, I need to make rapid progress, so I'm going to have to go traditional. I'm just going to have to make him get up there. So, get these knuckleheads out of the way. Now, I'm still going to try to, like, convince him that, like, there's something good in it for him. But just since he's tired, he doesn't have the energy to work that hard for that little goody. So I'm going to get him to give me a little effort, and then I'm going to give him a little help. I'm going to get him up a little higher. Oh, here, dude, get out of there. Go over that way. I'm going to get him up here a little higher. His feet are on the, the seat, and I'm going to lift his rear at the hip level, and I'm going to kind of show him what I'd like for him to do, and then he's going to get into the rack and I'm gonna say hey I appreciate it and then I'm gonna start shaking the four-wheeler around a little bit and remember what I told you guys I could have better session design I would have just done all of these elements over the course of a couple of weeks I got him to get up on the four-wheeler and then I would have gradually added some movement then I would have gradually turned it on and then I would have started uh, driving it okay but since I'm on a compressed timeline I just kind of have to go old school put the handle on him and make him understand that uh, certain things have to get done, whether they seem like a good idea or not. So I'm gonna go forward a little bit. Go backwards a little bit. Just kind of get him used to the idea that he has to move. I have the handle on him, the leash on him, to keep him from jumping out of the basket. But what's important to remember there is the reason he didn't jump out of the basket is because I made him tired, okay? So, that video didn't go exactly like I wanted it to go, <laughs> but I hope it did a good idea of showing you, like, 
you know, where puppies can be at 13 weeks old. Now, I'm not telling you, you know, I'm not trying to give you a hard time and say that your puppy should be doing all the things that my puppy's doing at 13 mm -hmm. weeks or what have you. Okay, but I do want you to understand that that is possible, okay? And the reason that earlier in the video I talked about the 12 to 16 mark being the socialization sweet spot is because all the stuff I did in this video with this puppy Okay, who we've made, we've maximized each developmental stage, right? So it was easy with this puppy, okay? Charlie didn't have those same benefits, okay? Charlie did not have the same benefits of the early socialization process, the ENS, um, uh, the constant exposure to mentor dogs that uh, my dog had, okay? But his owner contacted me and he got to work doing some uh, uh, cool stuff with my online course and he made up for lost time. Charlie was just a little stray, his owner made up for lost time, and then by the time Charlie gets to me, he's a good little student, he's willing to work, and he falls right in line with these other dogs, okay? So trust me guys, if, you, uh, you know, if you're at 12 weeks old, you need to hold your dog to a high standard, right? At 12 weeks, it needs to be doing more, okay, than just going out in the yard and potting. Okay, but if, if that's all it's doing, that's good enough. I mean, that's, that'll work, right? But between 12 and 16 weeks, this next month, let's really take and let's help that puppy realize its full potential. Don't get dragged down in life by what the can't doers say because we as a society are plagued by can't doers telling you all the things that you got to wait on or that your puppies can't do yet or whatever. I've shown you through this whole development, uh, critical stages in puppy development series, what puppies can be doing at each stage if you challenge them. And the reason that we want to challenge them, we want them to be at their mental and physical best, right? And if you go back to the other videos, you'll see me talk about the adaptive stress response. And what that means is that if you don't challenge your puppies, both mentally and physically, then their bodies and their minds will not respond accordingly, okay? So, during the socialization sweet spot, between 12 and 16 weeks, let's get out and make up for what hasn't been done up to this point. And remember my mantra, all you have to do to be a great dog trainer is be persistent, be consistent, get outside, get moving, and be interesting. Okay, if you will do that, then you're going to help your puppy be the best puppy it can be.